Hey y'all, it's Lisa with Nashville on the Rocks, and we're back with episode number four. This week we had such a blast hanging out and making cocktails with a very, very good friend of ours. He's a gifted guitar player originally from my own hometown of Rochester, New York, with a long resume of names that include Lou Graham of Foreigner and The Guess Who. Here he is, our friend Michael Sterato. Oh, Mike, thank you so much for coming in the studio. This is the first time I think I remember that I've met you in person, mm-hmm. although I feel like we have met at a certain point, but I don't know if that was in Rochester or I don't know if it was in Nashville. How long have you been in Nashville? Three years. Has it been that long already? Yeah, already, believe it or not. Damn. Wow. Okay. Actually, this July, it'll be at the end of July, it'll be three years. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we did meet with like the Farleys or something one day and Dan. Yeah, I can't remember when it would be, but, but you know, I don't probably. I don't leave the house. Well, yeah, you know? so it, it must have been, so it it must have been be a here. low-key event, right, you know, yeah, in the past yeah. couple of years, especially with yeah, yeah. COVID and uh, coming off of that. But, well, welcome to the studio. Wow, you are you on our much. fourth episode of Nashville on the Rocks, and I'm Hell so excited yeah, to have you. Thanks for having me. I'm yeah. really, it's an right honor to be here. I'm, I'm so, I, I feel so blessed to be included well it, this is going to be a very special episode for a couple of reasons one because you're a very talented musician and i can't wait to like talk to you more and really kind of get in and dive into your background and the music that you've been doing and you know like a lifelong like you have so much on your resume and the next part is is because you and my hubs Dan, DA, Hi. know each other and go back for a very long time. So not to put anybody on the spot with their age, but you know, just right. saying. So right. Do I have to pay you for saying all those nice things? <laughs> and we, we both got to pay her. Yeah, wait, like, yeah, I I'll, I take everything. I take checks, cashier's checks, yeah. you know. Venmo. Venmo, PayPal. Venmo works. Cashier right, checks right. are like kind of old. Zell. Zell. I don't have Zell yet, Neither but I. <laughs> I got Zell. Right, Where have you guys been? But yeah, so I'm so happy, and then we're all from the same place. I know, I know, cool and that? that's that's a lot of fun and amazing. What are you doing over there? I'm just making sure that my camera is like working. All oh, right. okay, all right. And, all right. And, and you know what's cool about it too? It's like there's so many people here from Rochester. Yeah, there really is. It's like Rochester just all packed up and moved down here. I kind of got smart, you know. Everybody, <laughs> yeah. everybody's like sick right? of the cold, yo. Right? Yeah, I right. can't really blame them. I don't want to say like anything bad about where I grew up, but no. at the same time, I'm just like, I am not meant for the fucking cold. That is not me. I understand that people are. I've always oh, yeah. been really cold forever, and at the same time, um, you know, it just gets to a point. I think that where you come from. Uh, and you learn so much, you've experienced so much, but then like you want to expand your horizons. Sure, sure. As you said it best, you know. Yeah. And plus, it's cool. Uh, the cold is cool when you're a kid and you're playing in the yes. snow. Yes. But when you're older, no, you, know, you got to go to work. Right. You got to yeah. drive. I always found that snow. The people that like snow are the people that don't participate in its removal. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's pretty. Look at the snowflakes. When oh. you got to go out and shovel that shit. Right. And snow blow it and freeze oh, your yeah. ass off. I could say ass, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're, we're yeah. open here. Freeze your ass off. Freeze your ass off. <laughs> and then there are the people that are like, they come into town for a little bit. Oh, it's nice. Yeah, and then so they're pretty. gone after a few days. Yeah, they're yeah. like, bye. Yeah, see here, you later. Take it with you. Take it with you. Yeah. I'm like, seriously, <laughs> take it with you. That's right. But so we are all from the same area. So we're going to have lots of stories yeah. to tell right a lot of uh depending on um variations of what the scene was like for maybe all of us involved yeah. so but i'm very excited and um one of the first things i like to ask people because i think it's a true telltale sign um it just right off the top and top i want to know like you obviously are you have so much like musical influences and I know you love rock music. Like you play rock music for a living, Mm -hmm. but what was your first rock album or, you know, that you, that you purchased or was gifted to you that you wanted? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember just before I got my first rock album, I was really into like, disco stuff because you know like charlie daniels okay. came out okay. the saturday night fever soundtrack the grease soundtrack kind of like what was going yeah. on in our world right. back when we were kids growing up <clears throat> and then i had a neighbor that bought a copy of van halen one okay 
And he said, dude, seems to be very it. popular. Yeah, he's like, dude, you got to listen to this shit. This is mind blowing. And I remember, like, the, the most cutting edge thing was Charlie Daniels, The Devil Went Down to Georgia, because mm-hmm. he said, I told you once, you son of a bitch. And like, being an adolescent, <laughs> it was like, you swore on a record. This is awesome. And you were able to recite the lyrics, and and that was edgy. And then. He said, "You have to hear this Van Halen record." And I was, "What? What's a? What is a Van Halen?" Right? right. I had no idea at the time. Um, I didn't even play guitar yet. I mean, oh. I was, I was a music. I played music, right? But I didn't play guitar yet. And he put the record on, and then obviously running with the devil, bum bum. You know that whole big intro it was like, "Whoa, that, that, what is this? This is incredible." So you listen to the first track, and then the eruption. Yes. It was like, what the fuck is that? Fantastic. <laughs> what is he doing? What, you know, how is he? How is he doing? And what is this all about? And it was like incredible, and 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 I, my mind was blown. Yeah. And still to this day, I listen to that album and that track, or, or any of the first couple of Van Halen records. And I think Van Halen One was the first album that I ever got. And, wow. And then subsequently, you know, getting into ACDC and buying like Highway to Hell and If You Want Blood and all those. Uh, you know, early records, you'd go to, I used to go to Jam Fields, which was right next door off of Spenceport Road. Okay. In Gates, where I grew up. What's Jam Fields? Jam Fields was like a department store, like a Woolworths. Okay. Yeah, so they, they had, a, it was within walking distance. I used to buy 45s, and eventually I bought a record, because you could buy them inexpensively back then. Yeah. And I had a lot of 45s prior to like the rock album. I never bought an album until okay. the Van Halen, but I had a bunch of 45s, sure. or singles. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, and, and so I had a lot of different styles of like, disco duck and ah. crazy things like that, and stuff that my parents listened to. Sure. And, but Van Halen one was was really the real enter uh, the 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 gateway into. That's rock music. awesome yeah. to like your music. Um, do you mind me asking how old were you? <clears throat> well, uh, so I think Van Halen came out in seventy seven, seventy eight. So I was about ten years old. Okay. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. Well, I always say that you and you and Dan, uh-huh. y'all grew up in the best. The best time for rock music, I think. Not to say that, like, there isn't, I don't want some people are going to take it the wrong way. Nah, nah, nah. Not to say that there's not, I'm not saying there's not good music since then, but you guys grew up in, like, I don't know, like the hardcore, like the first of it, like the cutting teeth stuff. You know, you got to experience all of that that the rest of us had to, like, kind of look over our shoulders and, like, figure out because it had already gone past us. You yeah, know, kind of. That's I so mean, exciting. It really is. It was. And is still. I mean, it's it's obviously stood the test of time, and it mm-hmm. really was pretty cool growing up in you know the best era of music ever. I yeah, mean, seriously. It, the singer that I play with in the Guess Who, Derek, always says, you know, when we're on stage at night before he introduces a song, he'll say, you know, we really did grow. We come from the best era of music ever. Not that today's music isn't good. It's just mm-hmm. not as good. Not as good. <laughs> so it really like resonates. It really resonates. And, you know, and totally. And the reason why I mention that is because usually the crowds that we play to. Are very receptive to that, yeah. And as you get a, a robust cheer, well, and, and that's why they're there, right? And it's a truth. I mean, yeah. it really is. I mean, it, it was pretty amazing because there was so much, uh, uh, in uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It was so much. It was happening right then and there. It was so much, you know, the uh, virtuosity. There was so much sure. stuff that was groundbreaking that we had never it was. It was. It was kind of happening right then and there. And yeah. there was so much great music coming out. All, all the time. And in, in, in the example of Van Halen, every Van Halen record was something of an event. I mean, Which it was something that was like, what's Eddie going to do now? I mean, mm-hmm. once you once you wrapped your head around Eddie Van Halen, then the next record is like, you know, there was always something. Spanish Fly on the second record. Sure. You know, uh, uh, and the Cradle Will Rock on Van, you know, the uh, Women, Children First. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, Unchained and on and on and on. It was always, it was really groundbreaking. And, and that with a, a multitude of artists were like that. You know, yeah. it was really cool. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you had such a change and such a shift in music at the time. And groundbreaking is the, yeah, there is no is better word, word for, for that. Yeah. Groundbreaking, yeah. So that leads me to what was your first rock concert? My first rock concert because things were also different back then so like y'all could go to concerts i feel like it i had i was old i was like 19 when i went to my first concert maybe 18 well i was you're a late I was, bloomer babe i know i was going to local shows but i mean my first big show you yeah. know was when i was like 18 or 19 i think the first show that made wait before you say anything mike i i, I want to I bet you I know what's going to be. I bet you I was at that show, but go ahead. Okay, yeah. Like the, the shows between you guys, it's the first show you went to. Yeah, do you want to okay. guess? Well, yeah. it's just, the fr- you know, everything he's saying about his influence was the, with the whole like John Travolta. It was that Saturday Night Fever. Yep, uh-huh. in Greece, yeah, in yeah. Greece. It was just, uh, it's just lining up with my stuff and then the Van Halen thing and then the ACDC thing you mentioned. And uh-huh. my, I can guess if you want me to. Go I ahead. mean, I'm going to guess um, Journey 
Maybe. Dream maybe. was early on, but it wasn't my first. My oh, okay. first, the first concert that ever made. But, ah. but that does play into it. You're 100% right. Um, being it's a big one of Journey the first. Fan. Yeah. So, so I remember driving with some my uncle and aunt from there, spending the weekend at their house, and we cut through Charlotte. Okay. And I think it was around Memorial Day, and there was a band that was really popular in the area at the time, and they had a free concert. At hmm. Charlotte Beach, nice Duke Jupiter. Dude, I knew right? it. Right, right. Backseat back Sally oh, opened. Oh, okay. Yeah, so Backseat Sally opened, right? And I think Cheater was on. Maybe Cheater was on the bill or something. Yeah, I can't so, remember. Yeah, but I think so. But I remember they weren't expecting like twenty five thousand people to show up in Charlotte. Of course not. It's only a free <clears> concert, and it made such an impact on mm-hmm. me. I mean, we stopped on the way home, and and I remember seeing the concert, and I remember being like. Holy shit! This is incredible, and and uh, and kind of thinking to myself, you know, this I think this is something I want to do. You know, this is like this yeah. is feeling what it feels like to be on stage and seeing the reaction of the crowd, and and it's wild because I I became friends with those guys later on after really? Duke Duper broke up. Dave Corcoran, who has since passed, God mm-hmm. bless his soul. I became a really good friend of mine, and okay. I ended up giving his son guitar lessons. So oh. it was really oh. kind of wild the way. You know, it all worked out, but that really made an impact to me. And, and oh, sure, yeah, and and you know, I got to play with Dave later on in a, in a cover band. We we did a cover band later on, mm-hmm. um, and uh, but that really made an impact on me. But Journey at Hollander Stadium was was an amazing show, and I think that's the one you're referring to, Dan. Yes, yeah. with the, yeah, uh, I mean, the Brian that, Adams. That was like up. a Brian Adams, right? That is so yeah. funny. Which I would never think Journey and Brian Adams would be on the same bill right? now later on, but like maybe at the time it made you know it was a little weird. Yeah. It was a little weird, but. I think that was 1983. Okay. I think it was in June. I think we just passed the anniversary. It might have been June 5th, 1983. Not that Jesus. I'm keeping score. I'm <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not that I just know these You're things. Good. But I mean, it was it was at Hollander Stadium, which was okay. a soccer stadium. Yeah. Over on Mount Reed Boulevard. I think it was Mount Reed and and Ridgeway. Okay, Ridgeway yes. Corner. And uh, I used to go there and see soccer games with my dad, the uh, Rochester Lancers. Used oh, to play that's there. funny. <clears throat> and and that was an impactful show. I remember seeing that too because Neil Sean was, is probably my favorite guitarist. Oh, awesome. And so that was impactful too. To see that show, to see the magnitude sure. of it. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, like that being said, like um, you've just moved to Nashville recently, uh-huh. but you have had a whole career, and you're born and raised in Rochester. And I mean, I think that for people that don't know, is that there's a lot of musicians like we've mentioned before that have a moved ton. down to Rochester a ton. Yeah, and um, a lot of them are you guys your friends that you've known like forever you've played with over the course of years like i've known people that have moved here too yeah. i know of bands that have just come down here to like even record and then head back and like go on the road mm-hmm. so that being said um those early days of like you know i've had the privilege to talk to people that grew up in nashville and i think that's such a special thing yeah, yeah, that really is, is such a special so thing cool, especially to, if you haven't if you didn't have the opportunity to do that yeah absolutely to see the evolution yes but then like growing up in another place where it's still so musical Mm -hmm. and has so many like wonderful memories and ties and connections in such a good community like how did that kind of shape you into like your first your early days of like music like were you like you were playing music at the time you were saying but like when did you like pick up guitar like did you were you? Did you have your own band for a while? Did you join someone else's band? Like, how did All that work that. out? Uh, everything. Everything. Yeah. I mean, I, the, the guitar. <laughs> I had to learn. I had to take guitar in eighth grade. Okay. Had to take keyboard or guitar. For school. For school. Okay. It was an elective in eighth grade. Oh, so, nice. <clears throat> I had studied music. Up I don't until remember the, this elective. You didn't have the elective. No, they were just like chorus or band or both. Well, they probably it probably evolved because yes. well, whatever budgets and stuff like that they couldn't afford an instrument. But I kind of like that too. Yeah, it was kind of cool. So I had a choice between keyboard and guitar, and and um, I decided that I, the guitar might be cooler than the keyboard. <laughs> than the keyboard. <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, and and I actually had uh, a grandparent that was very supportive and always encouraged me. She was a, she was a big Elvis fan, my grandmother. Nice. And she always encouraged me to pick up the guitar so I could sing and play like Elvis, which was her favorite artist. Oh, that's cute. And I rebelled against that. I mean, I'd played everything but guitar. I didn't want anything to do with the guitar wow. until I had to take it in eighth grade. Did she make you uh, learn those moves? 
Uh, she was like, if you're no. going to play Elvis like moves. Elvis, you got to dance moves? like Elvis. I don't think anybody could have those moves like Elvis. No, it, I don't think anybody moves like that. <laughs> no, no. The That's devil, like a the tricky devil's thing. Moves. The devil's moves. <laughs> yeah. um, That's funny. It's funny how we've evolved in those moves. That you <laughs> yeah. see some artists now that are going out there and it's like a damn sex show. You know? like <laughs> yeah, exactly. Porn. But um, yeah, so, so she, you know, I, I rebelled against the guitar and then I had to take guitar and then I fell in love with the guitar. Yeah. And and I just cool. I kinda took to it. And then in ninth grade I was playing I was still very much into sports. Okay. And I was playing uh freshman baseball and I went to practice one day and there was a bunch of other players that were talking about the House of Guitars. So bring it back to Rochester, right? Very cool. So they were saying, you know, the House of Guitars has Les Pauls for $99. I overheard this conversation and I said, do you guys play guitar? And I'm like, yeah, we play guitar. Do you play guitar? And I was like, I, yeah, I do. And I had just started. I mean, I hadn't played very long and I wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they had a band amongst them. So the, oh, one of the guys cute. was a drummer, one was a bass player, one was a guitar player. And he said, you know, we're looking for a, a, a second guitar player. And, uh, you know, would you, would you want to join our band? And I'm like, well, yeah, maybe, you know, and, and he said, well, this guy is a lead guitar, so we need a rhythm guitar player. I said, well, that's good because I don't want to, I, I just want to play rhythm. I don't want to play lead. I hadn't played that long and I really wasn't that good. And they said, okay, well, Saturday we're having, we're having band practice. Okay. And you can come out, come for an audition. And I was like, oh, okay. I'll, oh, I'll audition. come for the audition, awesome. right? So I'm thinking to myself, there's not a chance that I'm <laughs> showing up to this thing because I don't have the confidence. I'm not that good. And on the way home from baseball practice, I told my mom what happened. And she says, well, I'll take you. And I'm said, I'm not going. Oh. And she said, yeah, you are. And I'm like, no, I'm not. That is funny. Right, right. So she forced me to go. That is funny. And and just to sum up, make a long story short, that's kind of really the pivotal point. Because it was in ninth grade. So I joined this band. We played a talent show in high school, mm-hmm. middle school, whatever it was. I think middle school was still ninth grade. We played a talent show. And it was kind of the rush of, you know, I mean, we, we weren't good. I mean, it was, no, it, it was starting it. out. But it was like... You know, you remember those talent shows. Yeah, like you're, you're. That's the thing that like all the kids wanted to take a part of. So you're like, this is it. This yeah. is my moment. Yeah. So we learned three songs, three cover songs. We went up and played, and all of a sudden, man, we were like, we were like rock stars. Oh, it was of course. Like, you know, so we had the bug. Oh, so that's we formed awesome. this band, I and mean, we would play parties and whatever we could play. So fast forward to like our senior year. Um, I'm still heavy into sports. Music is just kind of like on the periphery. And we were serious, but we weren't that serious. We didn't have delusions of grandeur at that point yet. <laughs> and uh, I tried out for the baseball team. All, all of us were still you know, together. And I got cut from the varsity baseball team. No kidding. And the reason why I got cut from, from my recollection was because the coach was very strict and said, if your hair goes past your collar... You can't be on the baseball team. So the guys that were in the band were like, yeah, well, we're not cutting our hair. I'm not cutting my hair because we just started growing our hair. And they all cut their hair. Uh, and I, you know, just so they could yeah. conform. And I was like, I'm not cutting my hair. And he cut me from the team. So I was what? like, so yeah, well, you know, thank, thanks to the coach for cutting me because oh, I decided right then and there that screw baseball. That is I'm, funny. I'm gonna like focus all my energy on music and and try to become a better musician, a better guitarist, a better you know whatever, a lead player, and that kind of was my turning point. And and yeah, and and that's crazy story. Yeah, it's kind of kind of wild. I yeah, guess. that's well, so rock and roll. Yeah, too, it man. is rock and <laughs> roll, <laughs> right? Rebellion. It's such Hell a weird yeah. thing to be like you can't be on the baseball team because your hair is longer than your shoulders. Yeah, well, I'm, you know, but I mean, at that time, you know. It was the late seventies, early eighties, yeah. so we we're you know, very we're, dazed and confused. You yeah, know, that I mean, moment. People weren't really growing their hair yet, and mm-hmm. you know, having a tattoo or a piercing. Wow, you were you like know, a delinquent. Yeah, yeah, you were still kind of a you know, a criminal. You were still kind of a punk, you know, yep. or whatever. People, you know, weren't really as as open minded or receptive to you know cultural sure. changes that maybe we're we're used to now, where you know, uh, you know, it just didn't it didn't fly back then. Yeah, you know? well, that I mean, that is a good thing that he did that for you because it kind of set your path in a totally different way it really did yeah it really did were you, I, were you kind of pissed off i was disappointed yeah because like all my buddies we, mm-hmm. we all kind of came up together playing summer ball and school ball and, and it was like this camaraderie then sure and uh you know everybody we were all kind of shocked we were all like holy crap i mean he actually did it your name was on a list and you're like cut you're, you're cut and i was like 
yeah, okay. Wow. This is what you got to do. So, I mean, but it's a good thing, though. I'm, I'm glad, yeah. you know, in hindsight. Totally, you know. totally. I wonder if he, like, uh, you know, if you ever, did you ever see him again around? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't think so. I've never seen him ever again. That is funny. Well, I'm sure if it's one of those things where if he remembers you, you know, at all, and he sees you out in public, I'm sure that crosses his mind. Yeah, yeah. That's but, funny. And then the way everything has changed, like, you know, evolved throughout probably the next 10 years for yeah. him was probably much harder than it was the one time he had to make that decision for you. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I don't think, I think it was, I don't think it mattered to him. I think he was just doing right. what he was doing to put the best baseball team together. And, and rightfully so in his mind, funny. and maybe I really was a sucky baseball player. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I deserve to be cut. <laughs> maybe he was looking for a reason. Yeah. Could be. Could just be. tell him his hair is too be. long, long, long hair. <laughs> But it's funny. I have a I have a note that I posted on my social media recently that when I was moving, I, f- I was going through stuff and and when I was packing. I found a note from my eighth grade or ninth grade, whatever year it was, eighth grade guitar teacher that was kind of like saying that I needed to be more attentive in class and focused so I could do better at guitar. <laughs> so. Um, you know, thanks, God, thanks. I feel like teachers are so rude back then. Well, teachers were blunt back then. I <laughs> they mean, were very teachers blunt. can't say anything now because yeah, they'll, they'll get in trouble. But, you know, thank, thank, I really thank them for everything that yeah. they, uh, the decisions they made because it helped shape my, my direction. You know? Oh, my God. Yeah, that, I feel pretty lucky. It, no, you should, you should feel pretty lucky. This is a side note. We could probably cut this out, but uh, I got a bunch of stuff from my parents when they moved. And I pulled this one note, mm-hmm. and Dan was there, and I started laughing so hard. And he's like, "What? What? What are you? What are you reading?" And I'm like, "Apparently, it's a note from my first grade teacher, and she says she's proud of me for not crying anymore as much because." Um, <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> she's like, she's like, oh, as, you'll, as you'll start to learn and understand, crying doesn't get you anywhere. Wow! Wow! She's got to learn how to cope better. Toughen up, kid. <laughs> to tell a first grade. Wow. Wow. Holy smoke. I just, of course, laughed so hard and he was laughing and my That's brother great. was laughing. I was like, okay, I, the, all right. This is, I guess this is, I will keep this note because it's hysterical. Do you remember? Like, or did you? Did you no, yeah, no you, idea. You don't remember crying for anything, or anything? No, no, I don't remember. That's wild. Yeah, wild. But uh, so when You blocked it out, babe, probably. <laughs> yeah, trauma. Yeah, right, right. PTSD. <laughs> PTSD. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so... No crying in baseball either. No. <laughs> definitely <laughs> no crying in baseball. Okay. Um, so, moving on to that, uh, that's actually really great. So, like, it sounds like your grandma and your mom were, like, very strong proponents. Like, what about your dad? Was he... Yeah, they were all music lovers. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, was, I came from a very musical family. Everybody played something or nice. sang or did something. So, you know, that music was always around. Yeah. So it was kind of like either you were a music appreciator mm-hmm. or, you know, as far as listening, I mean, like parties sure. would be, you know, it, people, somebody would put on a record and everybody would, uh, everybody would, um, you know, enjoy that grown ups at the time we were still kids that grown ups would be drinking and yeah you know and, and enjoying cocktails and socializing. We'd be listening to music, singing, dancing, you know that's cool. Real party, real real mm-hmm. family party atmosphere, you know. Yeah. You know, it was that's great. That's funny. So it's cool to kinda of come from a family who, you know, like is supportive at the time. I think that that means a lot. Like I know um babe, you came from your family was always super musical. I feel like your guys yeah, is like particularly you have barely, my mom's yeah. side. Yeah, mm-hmm. they're always had a guitar laying around and um, just and just your uncles it up. played. You know yeah, what I mean? Always. You all yeah. like kind of did stuff together like that. I think that that and they definitely says a lot. they definitely like um, appreciated the music. They would talk to me about listen to this Beatles song and explain why they thought it was great. And they were always really artsy people, in my opinion. You know, growing up, yep, and felt fortunate. You know looking at music that way at an early age sure yeah. and it kind of it kind of formed it kind of planted a seed and formulated you know mm-hmm. your, your impression of music i mean because there was so much totally. good music back then and you know it was like ingrained in us you know mm-hmm. yeah i always think that well that just goes along with you know the timing and the the being lucky and then just being out there in the forefront like going to concerts was such a different and like like you've said is it like it was the first for a lot of things yeah. so it's like nowadays when you think of you know it's it's not i don't mean to be like nowadays kids right, right. you sound like that like back uh, in my yeah, day kid, back in my day but i do feel a little bad because like <laughs> in my era that i grew up with like i had my i i mean i never had i never had vinyl so like i had like you know 
cassettes, mm-hmm. which yeah. I remember like pulling apart like this yeah. accordion album's length and like reading all of it and looking yeah. at everything. Yep. But it was so small, you know, and I'm just like reading all the songwriters and reading the, yeah. everything, yeah, studying yeah. it. Right, right. And then, you know, like getting my first CD and then, you know, to like later on, like everything becoming so digital. So like, I always think of like back then of not having like, you know, social media and the marketing techniques that we have now, like everything at your fingertips, like you really had to put some work into getting that into the hands of the listener. Yeah, so absolutely. like when you guys talk about, you know, the things that came with the vinyls, like y'all were just talking about what, that Van Halen album? Yeah, yeah. And like, there's like another picture in there and then like what, there's like a joint in one or like rolling paper? What was that from? Oh, that was the Cheech and Chong record. Yeah, the yeah. Cheech and Chong record. Yeah, like, yeah. That, like that takes a lot of work and just creativeness for someone to come up with at the time like and it also feels like a special like gift which so if you buy it it's like it's yours it's that Mm -hmm. tangible thing in front of you and i not to go you know on a on a tangent like there's so many good things that digital music is good for but like that's the part that i feel bad that you just don't it doesn't translate to nowadays people don't they don't get they don't have that you know music is a gift in itself but they don't they just don't have that, you yeah, know. Mike, remember um, Spinal Tap? Remember they were giving away stuff, man. Uh, do you remember the, the stuff they were giving away back in the day uh, when they were promoting that re- that album, <laughs> that the whole parody? Yeah, man. Remember, was, remember what they gave away? I don't the, remember, dude. Sebastian Marino, rest in peace. Yes. Um, he ordered a Spinal Tap calendar, and guess what he got in the mail? What did he get? A Spinal Tap calendar. A, col- <laughs> a colander? Yeah, dude. For like, so like we, yeah. for pasta? Yeah, it had had it had like a, a picture of like Spinal Tap on the bottom of the colander. That is great, great. <laughs> and you know, the, the, it was a misspelling, I guess. You know, the management <laughs> fucked up. Yeah, that's great. That's really like the like the small little uh, the uh, the little Stonehenge, right? That, yeah. That was, but you know, that's so that that was so ahead of the time uh, of its time when it mm-hmm. came out. And I remember when I saw Spinal Tap, not really getting it. But now that I'm in the industry, it's kind of like <laughs> oh, wow. it's like almost like it's almost like like mockery, like <laughs> <laughs> you know, hello Cleveland. <laughs> it's funny because I had a hello Cleveland moment one time. We were playing, I was playing with Lou Graham, and we were at Penn's Peak. And I was doing this thing where I put a GoPro on the end of my guitar, and I was oh, doing cool. these GoPro videos. And that particular show, I happened to put a GoPro on it, and I was doing the show. And the drum solo was in the middle of the, of the, um, of the set, and I had to go to the bathroom really bad. I had oh to pee, Lord! Right? Oh Lord! So I, 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 I have my guitar on, and I'm running in this venue, and I'm looking for a bathroom, right? Right. And I'm listening. I have my in ears on, and I'm listening to the drum solo. So I know the timing of of how much time I have. You to, left in the middle of the solo. Well, I. That's the, hilarious. I, we were supposed to leave the stage anyways, but I figured, well, oh, let me take advantage of okay, this few yeah. minutes to go to the bathroom. So, and now remember, I have the GoPro on, oh, and oh, I go to the bathroom. And now I'm trying to get back to the stage, and there was a, a kitchen attached to this venue, and I'm trying to make my way, and I can't figure out where I'm going, right? <laughs> but, I, but I'm hearing it in my in-ears, and I'm like, holy shit, how do I get back to the stage? And I go to the kitchen, and I'm standing in the kitchen with my guitar on and all my stage clothes, and they're all looking at me, they're cooking, and they're all looking at me, and I go, hey, stage, where's the stage? And then I, I make it, I finally figure out, and I'm listening to Drum Soul kind of wrap up, and oh I, know, my God. I know that they're gonna look for me, right? And I get to the door and the guy goes, you can't go in there. And I go, I have to be there. And he You're goes, authorized, right? You don't, you, don't have a, you don't have a laminate, you don't have a pass. I go, I got a fucking guitar on and I got, and, and they're waiting for me. And you know? he's like, no. And probably I'm bang, 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 bang. And so one of our guys opened the door and he's like, get in here, you're supposed to be in here. And I was like, I, I made it just in time. So and that spinal tap, it's a typical spinal tap moment. You know? Dude, and it was, also it's a naked a gun story. moment. That's a great story. It's like a naked <laughs> gun a naked moment gun too, gun right? Moment. Yeah, like listen, Leslie Nelson go into the bathroom with the microphone still hooked up to his lapel. Remember yeah. That? Oh well, my God. But I have the GoPro footage. On my oh, are you doing yeah. that? And, and and the whole dialogue is like, I'm supposed to be here, right? <laughs> you know, they're just doing their thing. They're like, what does this guy he's want? He's looking for a laminate. I got a fucking guitar on. <laughs> You're you know? like, you want to listen to my in ear <laughs> right, monitors right, right. and like what's happening know, right now on stage? I know, it's crazy. You're like, I understand you're doing your job. You're making it really hard for me to do right, mine. Right. Well, you know, kudos to him for doing his job. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm sure people show up to shows trying to get on, get backstage with. You know that regalia on no, never <laughs> right? <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. So yeah, like let me let me get. I know I I've just been so like it's been so good to like kind of like go and talk to you about this. But um, 
so coming out of like Rochester, uh, mm-hmm. and then obviously you've played for so many people, like you played for Lou Graham for like a really long time. Yeah. And I want to like kind of jump ahead in that because um, what is he like? He's amazing. He I just mean, seems, he, it really is. Seems like a really sweet guy. Yeah, he's a really normal. He's like a hero of Rochester. He really is. He yes. really is. I mean, so just to back up a little bit, I grew up in Gates. Yes. Lou grew up in Gates. Oh. We had we grew up in a lot of the same areas. Uh, as, as far as a lot of we ran the same streets at different times because he's older than me. Okay. But but we we experienced a lot of the same things growing up in that town. Okay. Um, and going to the same school and obviously when right around the time that that Van Halen record came out, I think uh, I think Foreigner was just breaking too. And I I missed the whole first record, but Double Vision came out and and. You know, they were. There's a lot of rumors going around that the singer from this band that was becoming very, very successful, you know, was from Gates, and we were all kind of trying to put the two and two together of who he really was and what he looked like and stuff sure. like that. But uh, that's a whole other story in itself. But Lou is, is a really grounded, talented, humble, and really nice guy. Yeah. You know, he he. he I, I can honestly say that I'm I'm very honored. To call him a friend. Sure. I became friends with him in the time I spent with him because we spent a lot of time talking about our families, about oh, our yeah. heritage growing up, growing up in the same area. Right. We had, we had uh, believe it or not, we had the same English teacher, oh, except when, when when he was graduating high school, mm-hmm. Gate Charlotte High School, it was this English teacher's first year of teaching. When I was graduating high school, it was this English teacher's last year of teaching. He was, oh, that's he was my funny. He was my 12th grade English teacher. Okay. And when Lou was in 12th grade, he had the same English teacher, but that was his first year. Oh, that's funny. And I was on the tail end of that. So oh, that's we had a funny. Lot of, we have a lot of instances that kind of, that were sim- a lot of similarities growing up. Sure. But um, getting to know him and working for him um, was really, really cool. Yeah. I mean, really cool. I mean, I, I I could probably we could probably do a whole episode on on you know the I'm whole sure experience of it. But I mean, he he's like so highly regarded in the industry, mm-hmm. and and had you know not a lot of guitar players stand by his side and play mm-hmm. it. And and he had the confidence in me to give me a shot and That's give me awesome. an opportunity to you know take my game to another level and you know stand by his side and deliver that catalog, which was which I took very seriously. Sure, you know, it was a very something I really wanted to do really well at. Um, to honor him and honor his legacy and and his whole catalog and and really do it justice and and I was around for a while so I think I think yeah. he kept me because I did a pretty decent job I would think and, I, so. and I feel very 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 fortunate to have not only shared the stage with him but become personal friends with him yeah you know? how I mean, long did you play with him for uh, I started in 2013 and we okay. ended in 2018 okay but I had done some stuff with him before that yeah. Um, Earlier on, when he, the first time he left Foreigner, um, they were looking for a guitar player, and they invited me to audition um, just before he made the band full of brothers. Okay. Like he hired his brothers to play in the band. Oh, so he had done a short that. tour with that, and, and there's a long story behind that, which I won't get into, but I, I didn't end up doing anything with him. But I, I had done some stuff around Rochester with him, backing mm-hmm. him up for some corporate events. Okay. I did some recording with him. Mm-hmm. and. Um, yeah, so it, it, I was always kind of in the periphery before I got the nod to be the guitar player. Yeah, so, yeah, it was really cool. That's good. That's kind of it's it's like a way for people to check you out before yeah, vetting it happens. Process. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I I met him one time, and I was it was back in two thousand and maybe five, uh, six. Uh-huh. He walked into the I was working at uh, Barnes and Noble and Webster. Oh, right on. Yep, That's I was, where we lived in Webster. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he came in, and I recognized him. At the time, like, I mean, again, growing up in a little different era, uh-huh. I was really into, like, I mean, I kind of missed the whole foreigner thing. I knew yeah. who he was. Yeah. But uh, I went up to him, and I was like, hey. I was like, hi. I just want to know, like, I just want to tell you that, like, my guitar player loves you. And I was like, um, my parents listen to you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> the thing that everybody, <laughs> sure. like, probably doesn't want to hear after a while. Sure. I was like, my parents listen to you. But um, I was really big, uh, still am a big, like, movie, like fan of the movie The Lost Boys. Yeah. So, like, that was the first song I knew of, yeah. like, you know, 
Lou Graham and Lost I, in the shadows. Right? Yes. Right. So I was like, yeah, that was like a, a like a constant play like on my playlist. Right. So when I saw him, I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to go say sure. something to him. And but he was very, really nice. He's very approachable. Yeah, he was very approachable. There's one thing I noticed about him is like as we traveled, he's very uh, accommodating to his fans. Yeah. And we would. And what amazed me was, and, and a lot of artists can probably relate to this, is like when you fly into a city, you go to get your luggage, and there's these autograph collectors oh, and yeah. luggage probably and, don't even and, think about it well like you're not thinking about it when you're no, just but, flying but they're showing up everywhere with these albums to sign yeah and the thing that i i noticed about him in that situation and at meet and greets and when he when he interacted with his audience and it's something i learned too from him it was a very valuable lesson is to treat them you know well kindly yeah yeah treat them kindly give them a few mm -hmm. minutes because um, and he would give them more than a few minutes. I mean, mm -hmm. he would sign everything. That's cool. You know, e even with the autograph guys, knowing that they're going to sell them or whatever, he or would something. still sign things. He yeah. would still take a few minutes. You know, and I, and I would ask him, I, I, Louis, are you okay? You want to do this? Trying to rescue him, get him out. He goes, no, no, I'm good. And he would keep signing. And, he That's would, and good. they would come with stacks, you know, wow. carts full of stacks of stuff. And, you know. That's crazy, like, that to think that, well, it's just one of those things where it's like, you can imagine that you're a person you you know you can only take so much mm -hmm. of you know you need your you're probably tired or you're whatever mm -hmm. but i always appreciate when people stop and just make a little bit of time because i feel like it goes a long way yeah, yeah you know for the appreciation for for people but you know sometimes people can be too much and i definitely can understand why musicians and you know everybody else in that position wouldn't <laughs> want to do it so anytime you find someone that is approachable and is kind as long as you're being respectful i feel like that's a really cool sign absolutely absolutely know? and it says a lot about his character and who yeah. he is i mean given given giving them the time uh just a few minutes you know sure. it, i know as a fan myself mm -hmm. of, of several artists you know you get that few minutes with them you're like wow this is so cool you yeah know, they're, they're such great people it really reinstates your 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 fan your your your, your appreciation for them and mm -hmm. it really want to really makes you want to be a fan of them totally you know versus like meeting that one artists that you idolize and then they're a complete douchebag and you're like wow that happens when they down. say don't meet your idols sometimes right. like i get it sometimes people have bad days right. but then you but then you hear things or you meet them all the time and you're like you know what i don't know i can't help but to kind of like feel a certain way about you at this point you know yeah. it's too bad that it's like that but you know it, it it really goes a long way when people are a little bit kind to you in that sense and, so. and and really, what does it take just to be kind? Just to be kind in general. Just humanity. Yeah, right? that's it. That's all. We're all people. We're all people. Right. We all like wake up, put on our shoes the same way. Dan, I'm sure you have a something to go along with that. Um, it reminds me of uh, the cowbell scenario with uh, Christopher Walken. <laughs> you know, what's his name? Bruce Dickinson? Yeah. <laughs> the he's, Bruce he, Dickinson. He, he's a producer. He's just like anybody else. But when he puts his pants on, he makes gold records. That's exactly. Right. Okay. This right. is where I was. This is exactly where I was thinking. I was like, wait, I feel like there's something in my head that is leading me to turn to my husband right now because, yeah, that's who says that. Anytime, babe. Anytime. Anytime Action. I put on my pants, I make gold records too. That's so. right. Oh my god! <laughs> That's right. That's so, right. Uh, jumping back for a second, um, mm -hmm. so you were, you know, like now you've played for a few bands, like you're out of high school, mm -hmm. um, and you're just playing music. What are you doing at this point in Rochester? Are you just like, you know, you guys are in the same scene. It sounds like back then, you know, in Rochester it was a pretty like fertile scene like a lot of people it was, came it, out uh, yeah people appreciated music mike remember yeah. when yeah. um yeah. you'd play a show and there's always be a crowd there into yeah. you guys and you know it's i thought rochester was a really cool place to grow up playing yeah, music absolutely. because a lot of people were trying to write material yeah. way back in the day right yeah. yeah there was a scene and there was a, a consciousness that was happening and if you remember dan you could go out and see several bands in one night on all all sides of town. There He's was, talked about that. Yeah, there was yeah. what, what was yeah, the place was in great. Webster? TC Rockers, mm -hmm. and then you had the ER Junction. Mm -hmm. You had the Riverboat. You had the Penny Arcade. You had the Playpen. You, you yeah. had there's tons of places, and you could you could bar hop. You can catch a little bit of each band, mm -hmm. and and there was a lot of things happening, and there was a lot of things to take in. Yeah, you know, I, I remember being underage, getting in these clubs and just like it was like a, it was like a lab experiment because you were like <laughs> studying you know watching what these guys that were a little bit older than you a little bit more advanced than you and you're taking it all in going okay okay I'll do, do that don't do that do this you know you're kind sure. of learning yeah learning. learning so there was a lot of stuff to to study um 
And I think, you know, Dan and I kind of came up at about the same time. I mean, in fact, yeah, it even much. goes back even further to the talent show days in high school. I remember seeing Dan and his brother play in uh, Diamond Tear, and you oh guys were doing gosh. Queensryche covers at the Monroe County Fair. Oh, my God. Do you God. remember that? Dude, I remember doing Queensryche. We used to open for it, and one time that we, uh, I think we played the, this Mumford Fire Hall. Right. We didn't have enough material, right? So you they, played it over and over again? They made us go out there again. We didn't have anything. Right. So we played it again, dude, like it was nothing. <laughs> yeah, but those are the formative years. I mean, that's you know, awesome, though. I mean, that's the way we came up, and, and there was a lot happening. And then there was also, you know, I remember seeing you guys at the beach when everybody hung at the beach after, and we weren't old enough yeah. to go yeah. to the Panera Cave, but we could hear stuff going on. And there was like a congregation of, of, of people, all our friends listening to music, and kind of, you know, sure. there was like a, a, a something happening back then, you know? Yeah. It was a good place to grow it's up. It's like sparks in the air. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like yeah, we were fortunate, man. Like name some of those bands that we were all hanging with and, and playing man. with, man. You guys, there was like Icewater Mansion was a big band, Pantera with a A at the end. That's the early days, right? Right, right. Not like not like the not like Dimebag Daryl Pantera, but um, you had Cheater, you had uh, Kid Curry, you had you know the band. That that, remember the little trolls? The little trolls. I mean, I I remember Talus. I remember seeing Billy Sheen and Talus. I nice. remember seeing the you know the with flyers. Phil Nero singing for yeah. them. Who I went and I ended up playing with him after doing. He's some, an amazing singer, huh? I know, and he just passed away recently too. I yeah. can't believe he's gone. Mm. Um, but I mean, seeing Billy Sheen in the Penny Arcade. Mm -hmm. It was just like, I mean, you know, the Rods, you know, the, the yeah. you know, you know, Rods was an offshoot of, of Ronnie James Dio's cousin, yeah. you know, uh, uh, um, what was his, what was the guitar? You remember the guitar player's name of that, uh, Feinstein, Dave, the rock Feinstein okay. and Carl Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And, and I remember seeing them at the Stutzen theater. They, I mean, they played, you know, they had concerts. I mean, they, they was, there was stuff going on all the time all the time yeah, so there was like you know we were the up and comers and we were like the ones just trying to scratch the surface trying to get into these clubs sure. so we would play like the star search the maiden in rochester competition that's awesome and yeah and and you know you play on an off night you play on a sunday you play yeah. on a thursday because right. you weren't, all those you, weren't sunday drawing, gigs, yeah. you know mm -hmm. but the drinking age was all, i was 18 yeah I remember and then that. it became 19 and then For it became minute. 21 and i think that was kind of like the pivotal point where things started to decline because, you know, as they were trying to uh, affect dr drinking and driving, mm -hmm. rightfully so, but it was also starting to impact that what was going on what in kids the clubs. Are, yeah, I wouldn't say kids, but what uh, late teens are doing because at that point, now that they're moving into twenty one, like their priorities might be just different. Right. And then they know? had teen nights yep. where they wouldn't serve alcohol, but it was on a Sunday, yep. Sunday afternoon or something like that. But oh, it was still cool. Those. They were trying to still keep, you know. The, the 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 culture and the, and the vibrance of of of, of what was happening sure. but i still think i still think coming up in rochester there was a lot to a lot to be taken in a lot to learn mm -hmm. and i think that's a big part of who i am now is taken yeah. from that because there was so much talent so much talent so much talent and everywhere i go in my travels now you know where are you originally from well where do you live well i'm from nashville well i'm not actually from nashville i live mm -hmm. in nashville you now, live in but nashville. i'm actually from western new york well where in, in Rochester, oh man, there's so many good players from Rochester. Steve Gadd, Lou Graham, you know, uh, on and on and on. It goes, you know, those are just a couple. But, um, you know, the thing I always hear is what's in the water in Rochester. Yeah. But it really isn't what's in the water. And I think we talked about this on the mm -hmm. phone. What's in the ice? What's in the ice? Because it's so fucking cold. <laughs> it's so cold. So you're stuck in the house and you, you're forced in the wintertime, in shorter days, you're forced to focus on something and, and hone your craft and mm -hmm. you know and I know Dan can relate to this I remember his the bands he was in the rehearsal the end of his rehearsal we'd go into a rehearsal room yeah. I don't know if kids do that nowadays you know I don't know if if if, if like it's a good you, question I don't know if we're aging out like you know as far as bands playing in clubs I know here mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a very vibrant uh, music scene that, sure, that yeah. seems like there's a lot of you know there's a lot of replenishment yeah you know, and, and probably because... I would say that's true. I, I, I feel like I see a lot of it. I mean, well, in different ways. So, I mean, I've worked downtown for a long time. So, mm -hmm. that's almost a whole different beast in and of itself. But right. I feel like there are quite a few bands that, you know, play original music that, you know, don't have anything to do with uh, playing downtown or mm -hmm. shifts or gigs or anything mm -hmm. like that. And mm -hmm. they're just, yeah, they, they are like practicing at people's houses and whatnot. And I feel yeah. like that's that's really good, though. Um yeah, it does make you kind of wonder, you know, like what they're doing. Yeah. You know, because well, everything's different. Yeah, before I moved here, I mean, 
you know, in Rochester, I, I, I was seeing like places close. Yeah, a lot. Like, less places to play. Yep. Not many people interested in really playing anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there wasn't that uh, replacing, you know, uh, uh, of the talent. You know, people were just kind of coming up with different things, sure. which is kind of like what's happening now with with. Uh, you know, big artists that are that are passing on, mm-hmm. and we're losing them at a rate where I feel like we're not replacing them at a proportionate yeah. scale that that you know that that is going to be able to maintain the level of talent that we were used to growing up in the greatest era of uh, music ever. Right? It's a little yeah. disturbing to think about that for me, at least. You know, it like, really is. I mean, every time you turn around, somebody somebody's like passing on and right. it's like who, who are, who's who's there to replace them is there, is the quality there right. is the intention there mm-hmm. is the integrity there i mean have people lost their way of 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 um approaching this i mean i know mm-hmm. when i when i was like to go back to when i was coming up and dan probably could agree to this too i mean we wanted to be the best we could be and we really worked our asses off and honed our craft mm-hmm. to measure up to the people that we were watching yeah and to try to be that good to get a gig at the penny arcade right because that was the pinnacle i mean like when yeah. you when you had a gig at the penny arcade or any place you know that was that had a, a, a reputation like that you were like yeah Right. Okay, now I'm getting somewhere. Yeah. You know, it was it was it was you could measure. It was a point of measure. Sure. You know, yeah. so you could you could um you could kind of say, "Okay, uh, this is working. What I'm doing is working." Mm-hmm. And now you're you can you're always can ho- continue to hone your craft. Sure. Cuz we're always, you know, refining and becoming better, better songwriters, better players. Your your style changes, your focus kind of kind of ebbs and flows, but you know, ultimately you want to be the best you can be and be around the best people. Yeah. To bring to bring you to the next level, to bring yeah. you up, you know, and and to try to perpetuate what we're all trying to do and, and create great music. Well, and that kind of leads me into thinking about something that it's almost like if you're not learning from a master, who are you learning from? Right. You know, so it, it's it's the same thing if like you're hiring someone and you you need people, you need bodies in the door or whatever to fill something. And now you got new people training the new people. It's like, well, what's the right. caliber that we're right. dealing with? Like, what's the everything you're talking about, like the love, the dimension, you know, the drive? Like, yeah. is it all there or is it just kind of a surface level with everything? Well, I mean, you know, social media is is great and digital delivery of music is fantastic because mm-hmm. you can get it to somebody right away right away but it also there's a downside to that too because now you muddy the waters with anybody can put music on digital yeah. format mm-hmm. and how does a an artist with integrity or an artist that's worth listening to and that's subjective um how do you get that to the mainstream how do you get that to yeah. people so they can hear it how do you don't how do, how do you not get lost in the shuffle sure you know so that's um you know going back to uh, you know Back to our day, <laughs> you know, you know, we really had to work hard, and and yeah. we really had to do a lot, and and like you said earlier, to speak to a point you said earlier, you know, when they put records out, how did they get that music to people? They sure. had to do something creative to get them to that, you know, to get people attracted to the music. They had to market it. They had to, mm-hmm. and, but there wasn't as much. Uh, there was a lot available, but you know, I guess I guess it was regional, where where you know, when you when you lived in a certain part of the country or a certain area, you were exposed to certain things by the way the what the radio played. Now radio is just like universal. It's yeah, like you know, there's true. like computers and and yeah. servers that are playing the same fifteen, twenty songs that's all true. the time and it's it's all being uh uh funneled down there. But you know, it makes me think of back to the statement I said about Eddie Van Halen. Think about the talent in nineteen seventy eight. You know what I mean? Like like it was mind blowing. Yeah. I don't I don't know if there's that level or that capacity of mind blowing things that are happening right now. You know what's interesting too, Mike, is um back in the day when there was like a real A and R department and they were always right. looking for new sounds. So it's like Van Halen was the only band doing what they were doing. And I just find that you get a bunch of bands nowadays they all sound exactly the same because they're selling so now you got a right. bunch of right 30 40 50 bands on a radio that trying to be a van halen sure of course they can't be but you know what i'm saying sure though, right? sure exactly exactly but it, to speak, you lose you lose out on the artistry at that point yeah. and it becomes more of there's no development of the artist yeah and there's just you it, know it becomes exactly. more of just like the oh devel- we're looking for a sound and whoever can put it in there which kind of leads me not to put pressure on not to put pressure on like newer bands or even like younger 
kids, but it's like they almost have to search harder yeah. for music. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like they have to search really f- harder for music and then it's like it's subjective so like it's kind of to what your ear is but it's mm-hmm. like they have to search for it and then like the the bands that are making music have like a duty to themselves or to their craft to like be better right you know right so it all becomes like reliable it's kind of like a crapshoot in a way it kind of is but you also have to beg the question think about some of the bands that are coming out now that are breaking humongous right mm-hmm. And then you go back to like Back in Black, mm-hmm. Hotel California, you know, Don't Stop Believing that are 30, 40 years old mm-hmm. and they're still, you go, you know, to to a, a bar and like I just went to CMA Fest and like I'm watching these bands play Don't Stop Believing yeah. on Broadway. Right. Yeah. It's awesome. You but know, you're like, they're playing it on Broadway. But it stands the test. It's a testament mm-hmm. to the artistry, the craft, yep. the the discipline that these these artists took into their studio and and created something that is literally a time capsule, mm-hmm. but yet is timeless. Yeah. No, totally. It. There, yes, indeed. Right. Right. I, I, I remember. That. I remember playing uh, Back in Black for my nephews. Like I. I I had all my CDs out and I said, pick anyone you want to play. And they put on, for some reason they put on Back in Black. I don't know why they were drawn to it. And they were young. They were like six and seven and eight years old. And I remember their minds being blown. I was like, <laughs> what is that? Oh my God. You know, and, and, and thinking that that album at the time was probably like 25 years old and uh, and going, wow, this really is transcending. You know, yeah. there's something to be said for totally. that. You know, so what is missing now? You know, mm-hmm. will the artists from today stand the test of time in, mm-hmm. in 30 years and still have those songs. There probably is a handful that will mm-hmm. have that, but it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see. And maybe they're not approaching it that way. I don't know. I mean, well, this is just my opinion. I don't, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't, no, it's I don't some, know shit. <laughs> I think it's something, no, I think it's something that uh, I think actually a lot of people think about it subconsciously because things are so different yeah. and the mechanisms of everything are different. So we've yeah. never been here before. Right. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, what people, what direction people go in, right. you know? I'm right. like, dig deeper, make better music, you right, know? Right. Like, But you do have to have someone who is at a certain level to learn from. That's right. what I think, you right. know? absolutely. So they'll use their template from mm-hmm. the history yep. and then hopefully apply that. And there are a lot of great bands that are, that yep. are, that are doing that. And, and uh, I, I think really- the last band I really got into was highly suspect, and Dan and I got into it at the same time. Well, I don't even know who they are. See, You're oh coming, my yeah. god! Well, and, and they've been out. I mean, they've been playing f- since like 2008, but they've changed. Their uh-huh. sound has completely changed. So they're evolving. They're evolving, which is good. Yeah, because that's what great. that's what bands in the 70s yep. did. Like Led Zeppelin didn't put out the same record every. You know, right? No, they, they changed evolved. it up, and I love Led Zeppelin. Oh, uh, but right. so we started listening to it at the same time separately. Like mm. he was listening to it mm. when he was at work, and I was like picking up like through Sirius or something like that. And I was like, oh, there's this band. So how did you discover them? Was it like on a playlist or something like that? Yeah, like no, I think it was actually just probably through something with Sirius or maybe even on the buzz or something like that. Like the one Oh two point nine, the buzz, like right, I heard right. them and I just, I think I learned from it on the radio. It must've yeah. been the buzz. I remember I was working for Taylor Swift for a while. Remember yeah. That? And they, and they I, probably uh, just had the radio on for you guys. Yeah. And I remember I probably was just in the car or something like right. that. And I just instantly got hooked. And at the same time, like we were talking about it. And he's like, oh, there's a song I've been hearing. And I was mm. like, I recognized it immediately. And I was like, yeah. Right, and right. so that was back in like 2016. Yeah. And so I have had bands like grab me, but that was, I mean, there's two that are recently out there that I really enjoy. And one are these dudes from Memphis. Mm. And um, the other one is this band, um, babe, what are they called? I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna have to shorten this, but um, this band hooked me so hard, and cool. I was like, and they're out there, and they're it's just, out there. It's how do you how do you get to the ears of the people? Who and that's the thing is that I heard that kind of I heard them on Octane through Sirius, right. and um, we might have to cut some of this segue out, but um, it I went to like their. I mean, they've been playing for like 12 years. They were in LA, and mm-hmm. now they're here, or mm-hmm. now that they've been playing, and their sounds changed a little bit. Um, but the crazy part was is that I went to their like YouTube page, and they only have like 4 million plays on one of their songs. Right. And I'm like, 
holy shit, like how come these guys don't have like way more right. than that? Right. And then like you go to like look them up or you look on these forums and there's just people writing like pages of stuff that they like about right, them. So right. it's just different. How you find it is just different. But you're like if I hadn't heard them on and I remember telling him, I said, Oh my God, I listened to Octane today and there were two bands that right, I like right. really dug. Right. You know? One of those n- bands that you'll never forget their name. You oh know what I'm saying? God. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm gonna check them out now. See now you turn me on to them. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. let's go gonna, let's go I'm hunt. Check them out. Hold on. Let me killer band. I love that band. Day what Seeker. What is it? Day Seeker. Day Seeker. I think yes. it's Wow, Dayseeker. Dayseeker, and they're from uh, they're from California. Wow. So, and those guys, like, I mean, they're got to be like, I think they were like twenty two when they started. Now they're like thirty two. So it's like they've been around for about they've 10 been around years. for yeah. a little bit. Yeah. So paying your dues. Okay. Right, so on. the so we're gonna move on to the next segment, which I think is gonna be a lot of fun. I'm gonna go get all my gear for this, but uh, how would you feel if I taught you how to make a cocktail? Oh my God. <laughs> I'm ready for a cocktail. <laughs> me too. It's Friday. Hey. Teach me, teach me. <laughs> okay, awesome. We'll be right back. So I've got everything laid out in front of us. Beautiful. Now this is going to be kind of exciting because you told me that you like tequila. I do like tequila. Well, I love tequila. Um, so I have the Altos Reposado tequila. Have you had this before? Uh, not that brand, but I've had a Reposado. That's fantastic. Yes, very nice. That's my preference nowadays is to usually get Reposado. But this, I think, is going to be a little extra fun because we've talked a little bit and you used to bartend. Mm-hmm. Long time ago. That yeah. is awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, just out of curiosity, when you bartended, uh, how, how long did you do it for? Not long, because I hitched a ride with a band. Yep. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> so about right. It was kind of like a conduit, but you know, it really wasn't sophisticated. I, and I'm looking at what you have here now, and, <laughs> and, and I think this is way out of my league. I mean, it's been so long, and, and uh, I mean, I poured beers and made, uh, you know, screwdrivers, screwdrivers. and vodka tonics and yep. s- simple things like that. I the think, basics. Uh, I think the most elaborate thing I ever made was Hennessy and milk. Somebody asked for one time, which which sounds disgusting, but was it good? No, I didn't drink it. Oh. Uh, the person that drank it, it says, "I was like, really? Are you are you kidding?" You know, really? Like, you really want this? Yeah, it didn't sound good, but he did. Holy God shit! God bless him. God bless him. Okay, yeah. well, this actually uh, to put a challenge to you because you you've handled some of these things before. This is not going to be that bad. This is going to be something easy. Now, okay. Uh, what we're doing is a variation of a like a strawberry lime margarita. Mm-hmm. Okay, like, so like mar- the margaritas are my favorite. Too, they are the so good. Yeah. So the wonderful part about this is I wouldn't be doing myself justice if I got a margarita mix. But for your sake right. at home, yeah, you could totally get a margarita mix. Now um, I would suggest though, if you do make margaritas, I think there's only one way they should be made: skinny margarita. Yeah, well, that right. Which they should was be, out the mix, right? Yeah, they should. Yes, they should be shaken. Oh, good. Shaken, shaken, shaken. Get them and extra bake. cold. You see people that just like pour the mix on top of the tequila, and that's yeah. fine. But I'm like, it's just so much better if you shake it. So, yeah. these are some massive glasses. Out. Oh, uh, that's okay. We're gonna work around that. Okay. Um, do you like salt on your margaritas? Sometimes. Okay. Not always. It depends. It, you know, have to be in the mood. And sometimes they like light salt. Sometimes they don't like salt at all. Okay. That is fine because we can do a little bit of salt on the yeah. rim. But yeah. how we're going to do this is... I think I'm in the mood for salt today. Okay. I'm awesome. feeling salty. Yay. <laughs> I'm feeling salty too. That was okay. a good one, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try to get this over the um, the wonderful table. Okay. okay. I'm going to take this Altos. So this is two ounces. This is an ounce. Oh. So you have one in front of you. It's on the other side. Yes. So. I see you're going for two ounces. Yes. Oh, well, I'm going to do. You're, you're I'm gonna, committed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to do an ounce and a half, which is this first line right here. Okay. So I'm going to give this to you. All right. I didn't realize I was going to make it too. This is cool. This is, yeah, this is All great. Right. All right. Yep. I'm going to teach you how to do this and we're going to pour it. You're going to pour it. Now that you have two tins right I'm there and I'm sorry, I didn't break that up for you. So there's one inside oh, the other. Work yes. I like it. I'm involved. <laughs> Okay. I can't just sit here looking pretty. That's right. And you're going right. to pour that tequila. Where's my cowbell? Oh, there's <laughs> yeah, your cowbell. Where's the cowbell? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> there's only one prescription. I'm going to explore the room. I'm going to explore the room. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Serious, so you're, you're gonna, no, you're this fine. This tequila. We have to this be serious. This is wonderful. It's, there's you no, haven't even had a drink yet, Mike. Come yeah, on, listen, man. Listen, <laughs> there's no smiles in drinking. Okay. So you have to. <laughs> you Throw have, some tequila in it. You have to pour it up to this line, and this will give you an ounce and a half. Oh, so the line? first line on the inside, yes, sir. Well, what if I go past it? Well, then it's just going to be a little more boozy. Boozy. Uh oh. Uh oh. You're good. Just below that. Okay. I'm gonna, okay. 
And uh, you're going to pour it into this big old tin right here. The big one. The big one. Okay, pour right in there? Yes. All right. Perfect. You did that well. Man, I'm good. That was easy, though. That was easy. And then you're going to flip this over to the other side. But there's still stuff in it. That's okay. This is why more some bartenders are better than others. I saw, some bartenders are really messy. So growing up Catholic, I saw one time a priest <laughs> doing the communion, right? And he did the wine, mm -hmm. and there was a little left, and he was just like... Yeah. They all do that. That's great. They all do that. They did that in my church, too. Wow. And I'm it growing up like in Italian you're gonna start, Catholic, you know, a priest that. walked into a bar. I thought you were going to tell us one of those jokes, dude. A priest and a duck walk into a bar. So I got to put that... Now, what is this now? So you're going to flip it over to the smaller Triple side. Triple sack, okay. Yes, smaller and then side. you're going to go yeah. up to like you see that little line at There's the top yes so you're gonna go to the one that's right below the top oh so i'm going to the higher line the higher line right, now we're talking and that's three quarters of an ounce look at that oh i did it perfect you did, it's perfect i did it right to the line see, right the to the one, line I, I didn't do the tequila to the line that's okay it's still Pouring gonna be there? delectable okay yeah. okay so then we're gonna do some other fun things we're gonna take when do we get the food? I'm gonna give you, exactly, I'm gonna give you this line. Okay, thank you. Okay, and you you're gonna squeeze it into the tin. Into the one, there's two lines. You want, you want half of this? Yep, no, two? squeeze both of them. Into this? Yes. Okay. And then you can take your excess lime and throw it in that little. Oh, yeah, I gotta get the full squeeze. Full squeeze. Don't waste a line. That's true. But when you're going fast, <laughs> you're a professional bartender, you don't put that much emphasis on getting all the lime right, because you gotta move No, through. and honestly, I would just, have this prepped ahead of time so i wouldn't do it but i feel like if you're at your house there's no need for you to buy lime juice that's just that's just like too much work right so we're gonna take some strawberries okay my hands are clean so mm. and whoops don't forget to pick that up babe so how, how much uh, how much do I, have? I i did probably like five or six yes really right exactly okay. And then you can put it back there. And this is some honey simple. Honey what? Honey simple. Honey simple. So it's honey and water. So it's like, like simple syrup is like a sugar and water. All right. So this is honey and water. Mm. And so it's like a diluted. Yeah. Thick. Right. In the small side? In the small side. You can pull it out up to the line. Better for mixing and cocktails. It's ah. so, you could put a little more in if you'd like. Depends on how sweet you like it. Okay, perfect. So we'll do that, and then we need some ice. We need some ice so we can shake yeah. this. Ice like Louis used to say, bring a little ice to the party. Did he really say we that? Brought little, we brought a little ice to the party. <laughs> okay, so we'll get you some. Put this in for you. Oh, I have a feeling that I'm gonna put the small side on it. I'm gonna do the shaker, right? Yes, you are. <laughs> you can do the shaker. Like this is sh gonna be fun. This is almost, almost musical. Yeah, it is. Cowbell, okay. Cowbell shaker, okay. Cowbell shaker. Okay. Feel that? How it's like in there, right? Yeah. Now we're gonna shake it for at least 10 seconds, okay? 10 Ready? Seconds. My favorite part. Go! <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, it's cold. <laughs> yeah, it gets cold. All right. Has that been 10 seconds? Yes, which is why, this is why I always think that margaritas should be shaken. Because I'm like about cocktails. They're extra know. cold and they're so, woo! Ouch. They're so much better. Sorry about that, people. Okay. We'll get over it. You see this mammoth glass here? Oh, yeah. Before we pour into this mammoth glass, mm -hmm. you're going to rim this <laughs> with a little whoa, bit. Whoa, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> easy. Easy. There's with kids a, listening. <laughs> Good lingo. Hopefully not. And then we're going to... Well, I want kids to listen. I want, I want kids. We want all people listening, but it's not our fault if they hear things they're not supposed to. And then you're going to... Yes, yeah, so you're just going to dip it in the salt a little bit. Okay, but I'm only going to do half of it, right? Yes. We said? Okay. Oh, it's not bad. Cool. Perfect. Perfect. And then you're going to take this, and you're going to just put the whole thing in there. <laughs> and it's ready to go, right? It's ready to go. <sighs> wow. I didn't think there was that much in this 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 guy here. There That's is. Cool. And these are, like I said, these are massive. So, and then right. we That's can I mean. throw an extra... Strawberry. We could make it fancy, wow. or you could just throw it in there. It might wow. look a little weird. I might just put the whole thing in there too. But cool. then we're gonna cheers this. Thank you so much for coming on the right show. On. Thanks for having me. This is yeah, awesome. Yeah, of course. Drinking on the job. All right. Great. Only other. There's no other. No other profession that you can drink on the job like rock and roll. That's true. 
Except yeah. if you're maybe if you're a bartender. Bartender. A pending. That's right. <laughs> Can you, can, right. Do you drink on a job when you're a bartender? No, I'm not at the place that I work at now. Some places I was allowed to. Yeah. Yeah, you still got to be careful, though. Okay. It's too wild. All right, cheers. Mm. Cheers. Wow. Cheers. That's, That's mine, babe. That is good. That's very good. Dan, do you want to try I'm a I'm empty-handed. Oh, yeah, I forgot. I got to give you an extra one. You got your hands full over there. Yeah, you're the, you're I working got, the board. Yeah, working the board. Buddy. Got too many buttons going on. Babe, yeah. why don't you take a sip of this, though? Because it's really nice. Try exactly. with a little exactly. bit of the salt. Sure. Yeah. Hmm. <sighs> That's really good. Yep. We could put you can put even a little bit more like, um, well, if you use margarita mix, you don't you don't have to worry about it. But it, you can always put a little bit of lemon in it. You could put a little bit more lime in it. But I like the fact that there's no margarita mix in this. That, that's how I like to make them. You have them. to email me this. Recipe. Yes, I will. Oh my god, absolutely. Yeah, and then maybe you can make one for your wife. Yeah. Yeah, because I have uh, I have some That's of the good. Casamigos. Oh, I love um, Casamigos. But I have the Mezcal one, which Ooh. is just a little too smoky. smoky. Yeah, a little smoky. I like their Añejo or their mm-hmm. Reposado or there's, uh, 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 what is it, um, Sin Caro. I haven't Añejo. tried that one no, yet. that was really good, yeah. Okay. It's really cool. It's got a really tall, skinny bottle. Oh. Sin Caro. Yeah, it's really cool. So the thing about the Mezcal for Casamigos they, that's a lot smoother than some of the mezcal I've tried, but yeah, like that actually might go very well in something like this. Yeah, absolutely. Because you probably can get past the smokiness. You know who I wish was here right now is one of my bandmates, Leonard Shaw, who has been to Tequila, Mexico, and he is like a he's literally like a like a like a wine would have a sommelier. Yep. He's like a tequila expert. Oh, and awesome! I'll show you in a minute. I have a picture of his tequila shelf. Yeah. I mean, he is. He knows so much about it, and he's so passionate about it. Yep. And he's like learned. He learned me a few things on tequila. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You got to bring him on next time. You yeah, come I know. Yeah, well, he's in Winnipeg. That'd be a lot of actually, fun. but I'll have to get him to Nashville. Yes. To get him to come and on here. Which band does he play? Oh. He plays in the Guess Who. That's what I thought, yeah. and that's what we're going to talk about now. <laughs> oh, I see. Good what you segue. Did you see. So she's how, good, Dan. Yeah, she's I'm, good. I'm, I'm going to take one more sip of this. The pro. Uh huh. Well, maybe you got to keep sipping that because I like that transition. <laughs> Let's do that again. Can we do that again? That was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, the whole the guess who? That's a pretty epic band. They've been around for a long time. Been around a long time, absolutely. Yeah. Like how did, sixty plus years? They've been around for sixty plus yeah, years. Started nineteen sixty two or sixty three, maybe in between that area. I probably should Jesus. know, right? Cause I'm in the band now. <laughs> either way that's crazy that's a long time yeah yeah if you're off by a year or two i think it's fine um how did this come to fruition how did i what me becoming a member of the yeah group? i'm assuming that you know they've just did, is it something you auditioned for did you know the guys ahead of time like, no the, and the irony of, of the last three professional gigs that i've had what i mean by that is like um marquee artists you know artists mm-hmm. with 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 platinum uh catalogs is i hadn't had to audition for any of them. Wow. Okay. It was I was kind of like asked, and it was I'm it's sure they, were, they they had there was some vetting process prior to that. Sure. Um, the guess who, uh, ironically enough, uh, came about just after the we started opening up from the pandemic and things started getting back to a normal. Band started going back to work, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but prior to that, I had just finished my first year with Lou Graham Mm. way back when I started with him. And the premise that first year was that Lou was going to do a year and retire. Okay. Okay. So I, I, I he's had some health issues. Well, not that he was just kind of like, I don't really even know why he just said he was going to, he wanted to finish the year and and he was going to retire. So the end of the year came and you know, I, 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 reveled in the fact that, you know, I did what I did for with him for a year and, and you know, wow, that was a great experience. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't know what's gonna I don't know what's gonna happen from here. I don't know what to do from here. Sure. You know, I, I didn't have any idea. So uh, uh, I started getting dates from his tour manager for the following year. I'm like, oh I guess we're gonna keep going. Like, what's going on? <laughs> right. So while that was happening, he had said, you know, hey, uh, we're gonna go another year. You know, can I get it are you committed to doing another year? I said, Yeah. So I gave him a verbal commitment, you know, uh, that I was that he could count on me for the next year, so in that short time after I committed to doing a, a, another year, I got a call from somebody that was affiliated with the Guess Who organization. Oh, nice! And they said, "Hey, the Guess Who is looking for a guitar player, and I think you'd be perfect. Are you interested?" And I said, "Well, absolutely, I'm interested, but I had just given my word that I'm going to go 
do another year with Lou. So given that, I have to politely decline. I really appreciate the offer, but I want to be a man of integrity, a man of my word, and, and stick to what I've already agreed upon. Sure. And uh, so that opportunity came and went. They found a guitar player. And fast forward now to 2021. Hmm. That guitar player that took the gig had left to join Sticks. Oh, wow. Right? And, <laughs> and I got a call again from them. Actually, this time from my friend Rudy Zarzo. Okay. Who's bass player at Quiet Riot, White Snake, and Very Ozzy cool. Osbourne, right? Yes. He Hell had yeah, sent, out a, sent out a, a message to me saying, mm -hmm. uh, what's your vocal range? And I was like, well, this is kind of a weird question. And I, I, I texted him back and I said, I'm not distance really. wise or like, you know, note wise. Right. I can right. scream for a mile. Maybe you can hear me. <laughs> I can scream for about two hours now. Um, <laughs> so, so I didn't know how to answer that question because I had never, like, I never qual qualified or uh, categorized my vocal range. I just sing. You just sing. I don't really know, like, you know, what range I sing in. But, um, uh, um, I said, like, you know, I can give you something that I've recorded that I sang everything on. Mm -hmm. So he said, great. So I texted him a song. Mm -hmm. And in the amount of time it took for him to receive the song and listen to the song, he texted back, great, exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> <Great>. Right? <laughs> He's like, so, I don't need to hear any more. I just need to know that you can do it. Well, the, the interesting thing is that f the fact that he thought of me, mm -hmm. okay, when they were considering people. And... The fact that it was Rudy Zarzo, <laughs> yeah, calling me, asking me, texting me, asking me this question, so I was like blown away to begin with. But now the anticipation to figure out what he was getting at, right? Because I had just moved to Nashville, I, I I was trying to figure out what what my next move was. What's next? Right, yeah. right. So so, you know, eagerly anticipating what his answer would be, I didn't hear anything for like two three hours. So I waited, waited, waited. Later on that evening, I texted him. I said, "Do you know somebody that's looking for a guitar player?" And he wrote back immediately, like he had his phone in his hand. I might. That's it. Oh, and I'm wow. just like, holy shit! Like, what? What is this all about? Like, what, what? I have no idea. He didn't tell me. But what was happening in the background is they were looking for a guitar player to pl replace the guy that went to join Sticks. Okay. And they had a short list of players. This is a story Rudy told me. We had a short list of short list of players, and I thought of you. I recommended you, and then a couple of days later, the management called me, and said, hey we have a short list of players that we're considering to replace our departed guitarist. And Rudy said, this Mike's the guy. Hmm. You don't need to audition these guys. That's I came out. Awesome. Yeah, it was like amazing. You know that what I mean? is amazing, it's especially really, for someone like him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and they invited me to come out and do some shows. And we did a bunch of shows from, from my recollection, it was on a trial basis to try to, you know, see if it worked for them and mm -hmm. see if I felt good. And I think we agreed to six shows. And then within that six shows, I just I just automatically knew right off the bat that it was going to be great, you know. So that's how that's how I got the gig with them. I mean, it, it, it was literally a text from one of my idols, wow. <laughs> you know, that I became friends with. Holy shit, that's work, awesome. Working in yeah, Rock and Roll Fantasy man. Camp and some Legend. corporate events. Mm -hmm. um, and I had made friends with him. And, and in those corporate events, you know, he, he and I uh, kind of bonded because with the – roster of people we were involved with in those corporate events he and i ended up being the most prepared players to come to the table in those circumstances so i think and this is just me going on a limb um, i think he saw that level of commitment level of professionalism and thought well i can really rely on this guy so now sure. i had this so now i had this amazing opportunity to join a legacy band mm -hmm. with his, and then to play with one of my heroes yeah. who was best friends and bandmates with, with another one of my guitar uh, players, Randy Rhodes, who was like, my, what, you know, of course. one of my favorite guitar players. So I had this responsibility to really have my shit together and go into <laughs> it, you know, but but that's what he knew me for is being prepared and being, yeah. you know, uh, uh, professional about it. And he knew, I knew, he knew he could count on me. In fact, uh, in that short amount of six shows, we, we did a, uh, a show up in Wisconsin called Moondance Jam. And it's funny, we played with Hailstorm Oh, love Night Hail Ranger Storm. and yeah. Firehouse. It was a really odd okay. pairing. That is an interesting Hailstorm, Night Ranger. Yeah, Firehouse and, and Firehouse. Us. Yeah, it was it was a bizarre bill. Yeah, but early that morning, 
Gary Peterson, who was the original drummer for the Guess Who, Rudy and I all met for breakfast. Mm-hmm. And and uh, Gary was saying to Rudy how grateful he was for recommending me because he felt that it was going really well and that I, he thought it was a really good fit. This sure. is the original guy, the original drummer from the Guess Who, has been in the band for every incarnation of the band, seen every member come and go. And That's got to be almost exhausting. Well... I'm I sure, would imagine. I'm, I'm sure that he's like, he digs it though. That's why he still does it. Right. But at the same time, it's got to be one of those things where he's just like, oh my God. Yeah, he's one of those lifers though, man. Obviously, together. he's uh, doing the music for the right reasons, man. Yeah. Doing it that Absolutely. long, man. I have Absolutely. so much respect for people like that that just keep going and get well, probably get better. You know? Yeah, and it sounds like he's, I mean, he's still open and has a good heart about yeah. it. He just wants people to, you know, obviously be a part of it and do a good job. Yeah, yeah. And he's keeping the legacy going. And he's seeing, you know, he's seeing his his, uh, you know, his history play out, and mm-hmm. you know, fulfill his destiny, if you will. But the reason why I'm sharing this is because it was really a really profound experience and moment sitting at that breakfast table, because Gary looked at Rudy and said, "Rudy, I, I I thank you so much for recommending Mike. He couldn't be more perfect for the band." And I'm just taking this all in, going, "Holy shit! I can't believe these guys are saying this." And then Rudy turns to Gary. And says, well, I trusted Mike the way Randy trusted me. Now, if you know the story, like, R- Randy got Rudy into the Ozzy Osbourne band. Okay. I did not know that. So, so originally when, when Randy joined Ozzy's band, I think Dana Strum and, and Frankie Benelli were the drummer and bass player in the band. Okay. When Jet Records, from the story that I learned from these guys when when they took him to England to record the record, they left Dana and Frankie behind for Lee Kerslake and Bob Daisley, okay. experienced members. There was some kind of falling out with them after they made the first couple records, and maybe the first record, and they needed a bass player. Okay, and because Randy played in Quiet Riot with with Rudy. They were good buddies, and when he needed a bass player, he recommended Rudy because he trusted him, and he knew he would rise to the occasion. So Damn. just for the sake that he, I mean, this is not like That's patting be- myself on the back. It was just profound, and sure. like I couldn't believe I was hearing what I was hearing because Randy was such a hero of mine, yeah. and, and being in a band with Rudy was the closest thing of me like meeting my hero Randy Rhodes, which is impossible because he passed away in that plane crash, you know? Right. So it's like to get that opportunity and then have him say that and hold me in such high regard, somebody I really respect a lot is like, holy like shit. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, man. that is amazing. Holy <clears throat> shit, right? Yeah, like holy shit. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, I thank my baseball coach for <laughs> for God, <laughs> me. Cheers. Cheers, trying Mr. To muscle me in the, coach. <laughs> trying to muscle me into getting a haircut. Right, Thank right? you so much. I don't know. Do I, like, I look like I get haircuts? <laughs> Come on, man. Anyways, Listen. that was kind of the story of how I, I, I ended up joining the Guess Who. And and here I am two years later, luckily enough that, um, you know, they, they're they they're confident enough in, in my contributions and my talent to be able to contribute to this great legacy. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it's just it's it's pretty wild. It's that pretty is wild. wild. Yeah, it's pretty that, wild. That that is so that is such a cool thing to be a part of. Like I feel like I if I was in that situation, I would totally have goosebumps. I'd be like, Well, I do, and I have goosebumps all the time. I mean, yeah. you know, especially when I was performing with Rudy in the band. I mean, I, I can only imagine what it was like to to be like Randy Rose looking over at Rudy because he's an amazing consummate professional. But I say this with extreme humility and gratitude. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, there's nothing that. I'm walking around like, you know, I'm the man or whatever. It's like, fuck, I can't believe I'm, you know, a little kid from Gates who had a dream, Mm -hmm. you know, took a chance in eighth grade playing guitar, not really wanting to play guitar. And, and here I am. And it's like, how did, how did I get here? Yeah. But it's, it's kind of like, it goes with everything we've talked about up until now. It's like all, all those little steps, all those grains all led to this. And I don't think that I could have planned any of it. Yeah. It just kind of, kind of all happened because I never really thought I would be a, a member of the Guess Who. Yeah. I never thought I would play with Lou Graham. Yep. I never thought I would play with Mark Slaughter, you know, or any of the bands that I that have been lucky enough to 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 been asked to play with. You know, sure. I, not having to necessarily audition, but ha- being asked to say, "Hey, can you do this?" you know. So that's, that's really cool. it's really wild. You no, know? and and, that and that's wild. like a testament to your character, Mike, man, as being a great player <laughs> and a cool hang and a great human being, and I just think that kind of 
He's right. Really pays off, man. Especially that. when it comes so natural. You That's know what I'm saying? Sweet. And it's sincere. You I'm, know what I'm saying? And you're one of those sincere that, man. dudes, man. I that I know. That. Well, right back at you, man. You know how I feel about you too, buddy. Oh, jeez, <laughs> thanks. Man. There's a love fest going on in here. It's a it's big like, hug. <laughs> it melts my heart over here. You can definitely drink my tequila. I'm sorry. I'm making you talk and do that, all the work. That's but right. That's right. I'm glad that you enjoy it. Mm-hmm. So, well, and that's one of the prime things that when we talked a little bit on the phone, like we just, we talked about that whole like idea of like meeting your heroes and like yeah. I think it's still so important to keep things in perspective because. You just never know what'll happen, um, and I, I don't say that in in a in a weird way of like you never know what will happen. Like if you're shitty to this person, they'll be shitty to you later. It's just about being a good person and like kind of living in the moment and being more genuine. That's the more, to me, authenticity is more important, and that like goes to your your you know the artist, the the skill, you know the, who you are as a musician, right, right. touring everything, right. you know that's what matters, you yeah. know what i mean? I think a lot of people miss that. Like yeah. they think that it's all about you know trash or yeah, yeah. And all that stuff. It, 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 there's it's there's a lot to it and mm-hmm. and the more you experience the more you realize mm-hmm. that there's much more to it and um you know the hang is a is a really a big deal. I mean, yeah. you know, compatibility, being able to be, you know, having some kind of chemistry with people and being able to contribute positively and being professional, yeah. just showing up, being prepared, all all the steps, you know, um, that we may take for granted. It all, all play, it all comes into play, you know. And that that kind of leads me into like the next part because I think you touched <coughs> on, you really said it perfectly. So, you moved to Nashville. Mm-hmm. Um, why did you move to Nashville after so many years? Is it something you always wanted to do? And well, then, or was it just a, was it one of those things that just kind of led you here? Yeah, there's a lot of things that led us here. I mean, we, I, I would come down here to, for, for your work, you know, mm-hmm. for playing or for recording or, or rehearsing or whatever. Um, and every time I came down here, there was something. I really couldn't put my finger on what it was, but it felt like home. Mm-hmm. It felt like I belong here. Yep. And I really can't, explain it i can't verbalize it it just it just is so i started bringing my wife and she started feeling it so mm-hmm. i started saying to myself okay well it's not just my imagination because she every time we left we would leave a little bit of our heart in nashville, in nashville. And then we brought our kids down mm-hmm. and they ended up like really liking it and then we tried to make the move a couple times but my touring schedule was too busy to be able to facilitate it and i and i wasn't going to dump all the responsibility on on them to do it i I really wanted to be part of that and 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 be you know be there for that um so we had talked about it for a while and we tried to make it happen for a while and we just couldn't figure out how to do it and then during the pandemic we had all nothing but time yeah right yeah right so so many changes right my wife lost her job during the pandemic yeah music was dried up i mean i wasn't playing i wasn't touring we couldn't i mean we couldn't do anything so you know we we had a lot of time to to just take it all in and, and go, okay, now's the time. Yeah. So right after right after things started to open up in New York, because New York was on a lockdown. Totally. You know? Yeah. And it was very different in, in many places. And regardless of what the reasoning was for the lockdown, we decided that as soon as we can travel, we're going to go down and we're going to check things out and really, really give us a go and, and, and try to find some place to, to land. And it's funny because we were hearing uh, rumors saying, you know, if you get caught at the Pennsylvania border or the Ohio border with New York plates, they're going to arrest you and send you back. I heard that. Right? right? Yeah. So it's, you know, looking back now, obviously it was all bullshit, but, you know, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was serious, you know, right. at the time because you're like, and my kids were scared because we ended up leaving like real early in the morning. It was still dark because we're like vigilantes escaping from New York, <laughs> escape from New York, <laughs> you know. And we drove, and then we came down. We spent like a couple of weeks. That's here. a fun movie, escape right? Movie. Right. So we came. We spent a couple of weeks here, and we were looking around, and, and we found a place we wanted to live, and mm-hmm. we and we ended up making the move. And that's we, awesome. It was in May, and then in July we were here. You know, we went back, sold everything, and and uh, yeah, so here we are. But that's but awesome. there was just something. There is something. There wasn't. There, it wasn't. Was something. It, it is. It still is. I mean, yeah. I really feel like this is where I belong. I feel like this is home. I feel like the, everything everything about it is conducive to what I do and what my mm-hmm. wife does. My wife's in the food industry. So, oh, you know, so okay. food and music have a lot in common. And this is a really big foodie town. Right, right. So everything worked. Yeah. I mean, it was perfect for both of us. Yeah. And and my kids uh, acclimated really quickly. I mean, it took them less than a year to, you know, because they were a little bit nervous about 
leaving their friends. They were yeah. really excited about doing it. Are until they teenagers? They're teenagers, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's hard so, time. So they were really excited about doing it until it came time to actually physically do it. Right. And then I promised them, I said, you know what, in a year, you're going to tell me this is the best move you've ever made in your life. Yeah. And luckily... <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly what they did. My son came home one day and he said, Dad, I love it here. Aww. I love the people here and my friends, my new friends are great and my daughter too. Like they made friends Aww. immediately because there's just this, there's just this consciousness, there's this warm togetherness, there's a, there's a, there's a vibration. It's as crazy as that yeah. sounds. It's no, really true. No, I feel like that's accurate. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I want to make a comment about that whole thing about the Nashville vibe. Yes. yes. What you were saying. Um, you know, being from the north, and I have these theories, and I'm just wanted to run it by you. It's like when you're in the north, think about the physical things that are making you behave just by default. Like think about how warm and open everybody is down right. there. You know, it's like it might have it might have to do with the weather. Up in north, it's kind of cold. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? So people, people are just might mad. be uptight. Well, I'm saying like might they be a little more yeah. guarded. You know what I'm saying? And well, just physically, they're just kind of. I not think as that, yeah, positive I about the tomorrow or something. I don't. I don't know. It's just a little theory. No, because I got. they don't want to deal with going outside and having to shovel seven. Freeze your ass yeah, out, right? Like, right, right? But you know, they, they don't realize if you're there and you've yeah, been you born there, that. you don't even realize. No, that's just how what you, you know. Yeah, that's, that's what true. you know. It's true. And when you come down here, it's eye-opening, Dan. It's 100. percent You know, yeah, and every, weird, every now and then. Right? Every now and then, my, my friends here will say, easy, New York. Yeah, <laughs> and I know yes. I got to step back and just, yep. oh, yeah, big oh, time. I, I still get that after after so long. Um, and I feel like I've done, I mean, for being in the for being in the uh, service industry for such a long time, mm-hmm. like, I feel like I've I've done well. Mm-hmm. People are like, why do you say y'all? You're not from here. I say, I listen, y'all is all encompassing. Right. It's easier to say y'all than, hey, guys. That's you right. know what I mean? Like, Y'all, I was That's like, right. if you want me to turn on New York, I can do that. But right. like, use guys, use guys. But I was like, <laughs> but I can, I can make it happen. But I, I think Dan and I have talked about this too. I was like, there, Nashville is so like, it's such a big little town. Yeah, and everybody knows everybody, yeah. whether it's music or food related or service related. It really is. It, they really do, yeah. and it's like. It's really important for people to be good to people here. Yeah. Um, it really is that like hometown, mm-hmm. like southern hospitality kind of thing, which is mm-hmm. very nice. And I feel like people always, they're not from here. Like Nashville changes people and they mm-hmm. kind of mold to Nashville, mm-hmm. not the other way around. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, who wants to be a dick? You know what I mean? So it's like if you're around a bunch of people that treat you like family and right. openness, like you're gonna yeah. like that. Yeah, you people know? are warm, and we made friends really easy. Yeah, and uh, and I, I I know that I give New York so much of a, but you know, there's a little bit of like a play there. But I mean, I he knows the first the first year I went back there, I went on vacation and well vacation, yeah. I went back to New York and I stopped uh, at Walmart to get a few things, and I'm in there. No one said anything to me. Yeah, I was in the store for like twenty minutes. I passed by everybody. No one said anything to me. I cashed out with the clerk, and not to be rude, but I just was waiting to see if she would say something to me. Right. Nothing. No. Had the transaction, everything. I was like, I know I'm home, and nobody was being rude. Right. It was just that's how it was. Rude just is. It just is. Right, and right, I'm just right. like, I'm the, I remember the first time coming here. I went to the grocery store and I was looking for something and I had a little girl, like I say little, I mean, she was probably in her mid twenties, but she comes running around the corner. She's like, ma'am, I found both of these for you. And I was like, what do you want? What do you want from me? Right, right, right. What is this? Thank you so much. I what was is like, this thing approaching me? I was like, oh my God, thank you. Like, I, You already told me what aisle it was. I could have found it. She's like, well, I just walked by and right. thought you could use it. And I was like, that is so incredibly right, sweet. Right, right. So I just think that it's, it's little things like that that kind of make the sweetness. It sounds cheesy. It sounds corny. And it doesn't mean that other places are not like warm and sweet and friendly. Yeah. But there is something very special about Nashville. There is. There very really is. Special. And, and I think that like we bring all the good from New York with us mm-hmm. and try to incorporate it into that. Yeah. Because you know, my, my wife and kids went back to New York last year to visit some family that's there. And um, my wife told me, my kids said within a day, they were like, I'm ready to go home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, because they're like, they just like it here. They know? like they, it they here. Feel, they feel more included. And one yeah. thing I noticed about young kids, all the friends that my kids have made, that they when they bring their friends over, they address you. Hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Mm-hmm. They have a very their 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 morals mm-hmm. and their their uh, uh, manners. Their manners. They're taught well. And then before they yeah. leave, they come up to you. Thank you, sir, for having me. Thank you, ma'am, for having me. And I'm like, in New York, 
some of my kids' friends, like, you didn't even know they were there. They didn't yeah. look at you. They didn't say anything. They didn't say thank you. You, you know, didn't even they, know they were in the house. Exactly. And, yeah. and and these kids go out of their way to do that. And there's, there's something to be said for 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 you know the South and and mm-hmm. for you know uh, the upbringing. I mean, it's it's not all as bad as like the rap that it gets. You know what I mean? Like well, uh, you know, I feel like that's it just, happens. Yeah, that's you just, know. You know it, it's it's like anything else. Until you experience it, you don't know. You don't know what you don't know. And then when you and then when you when you figure it out, then you start to know. You know. Yep. And and you know, coming here and and for as many years and leaving, and leaving a piece of our heart. And I hear people mm-hmm. say it all the time. They come down here and and they'll say, I just love it there. I mm-hmm. just feel you know. And, and everybody wants to move, mm-hmm. but some people sometimes they're afraid to make or, actual, or, s- or some people just can't for right, whatever for reason, whatever reason. or really yeah is. maybe they are afraid to kind of make that move and yeah uh, i've i've had nothing but good experiences here along the way and, oh absolutely and you know it's like you know i don't mean to like i said i always feel like i hit new york and slam new york so much it's really not about that it's just like you said like you know what you know until yeah. you experience something different yep. and then it just kind of blows your mind and you're like oh that's really cool yeah i, I really appreciate that i didn't know how much i appreciated absolutely that. i read a fact recently i was reading something i think i was on a plane or something reading a magazine they said that most people don't leave or don't don't travel farther than a 20 mile radius from when they're born and that to me is 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 a is a wild that is wild yeah it's like and, and it but it makes sense if you look at some of the people that and, and this is not a knock to them because like i said you don't know what you don't know yeah if that's all you know then that's really who you become yeah right and 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 for some people that's good mm-hmm. and that's good that's okay right but there's other there's another segment of the population that need more Yes, and they have an Indian spirit where they yeah. want to search and they want to explore and they want to expand and do things. And I think that's what draws people to Nashville. Totally. And then they come here and it becomes this melting pot of different ideas and cultures. And mm-hmm. I think that's what plays into the whole music thing: is you get the best of the best all coming here, and 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 really raising the bar. And that's why yeah. I think, you know, it, Dan, you could correct me. If I'm wrong, but it used to be the country music capital of the world, which mm-hmm. has now evolved to Music City. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely uh, it's got right? everything, man. Yeah. You know, it's everything. I mean, well, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this podcast was because it's like the the rock scene is so important here. And I mean, I love all types of music. Yep. I've always been drawn to rock and and hard rock, and right. you know, but people don't really know that. And the one they still just think about it, you know, and it's 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 what's on the surface. But there's so many more things <coughs> that once you get to like being here and walking around and spending time here yeah. and going to different places to listen. Like you said, sure. Broadway. Oh my God. ACDC's playing. Yeah. I walked on Broadway, I heard a Pantera song. I mm-hmm. was like, what? I heard and the Cranberries. They were doing great. They're, I heard you know? that song Zombie by the Cranberries. Yep. You know? um, and I heard Enter Sandman. You mm-hmm. know, I mean, when I first started coming here, it was all honky tonks and they were yeah. mostly, it was mostly country music. Mostly country. country. Rock. And, you know, you walk into Tootsies, you didn't hear, you know, uh, eggs in light, you know, <laughs> yeah. or, or a countrified version or, 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 you know, but God bless him. You know, it's yeah. great. I think it's Dude, great. Dude, you sounded just like James Hatfield. Did I? When you, said, now you closed your eyes I for a second. I swear to God. Yeah. <laughs> you, you had the rasp. <laughs> well, <laughs> and I think that that's the cool part is because it has become, especially recently, so much more, probably like I would say recently, 10, 15 years, so mm-hmm. much more of a melting pot. <laughs> don't exist. I do have, because um, I know we want to have you back on the show and we want to mm-hmm. talk about so many other things, but I do Absolutely. have um, another like question for you. So like, yeah. The Guess Who. Mm-hmm. Now you did show us some music, which obviously, like, we can't show everybody right now. But right. like, when is that going to be released? June thirtieth. June thirtieth. Yeah, it will be released June thirtieth digitally. That's like in nine days. Yeah, Eight, like seven nine days. days. Yeah, yeah. We okay. recorded it about a year ago. Last July, we recorded it. Awesome. And the whole process has taken until now. It's melting pot, guys. Sorry, melting pot. My bad. <laughs> stand corrected. Well, look at that. How you stand corrected? That's okay, babe. At least Sorry you can say my bad. Are you saying you were wrong? Like Fonzie, I was, r- 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 <laughs> not mankind's been let down. <laughs> well, your leather jacket's the same. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> June 30th. So June 30th. Yeah, June 30th will be the digital release. Okay. And I think CDs are, are ready, um, available through the label Deco Entertainment, which is a subsidiary of Warner Brother Records. Um, Amazon, any place you get your music. Nice. So vinyl, 
I think the street date is August 25th ish. Oh, cool. Because there's such a backlog and demand for vinyl all of a sudden, right? All Does that have to do with COVID? No, I think I don't know. I don't. I really don't know. I think it's just a, a matter of the demand. And they okay, don't have the much demand supply because it's a petroleum product. Yeah, that's and true. And you know the whole thing with uh, petroleum and all that good stuff. I think. Again, no, don't call me. I might be wrong. No, I think I feel like you're right on that. I just was curious because it's one. You know, there's so many things that are just back ordered. That's one thing Dan and I need to get. Sorry to go off topic. We need to get a vinyl. Like we need to get a record yeah. player. We don't have one. We have so much vinyl in this make house. It's such a comeback. I know. And it sounds so much. Uh, it, it, better to me i mean yeah. it's just a fuller, fuller audio sound. experience yeah i mean it really does in fact it's funny because my kids love country music mm-hmm. especially contemporary country and my son loves morgan wallen mm-hmm. okay so he went out and actually bought his own record player album no no oh, I, he and, used my record player but he bought an actual vinyl oh, okay because he, he just wanted to have the vinyl yeah and it's amazing he's 19 years old and he and and I've had vinyl all these years and a turntable all these years, but he's never really had the reason to 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 listen yeah, to anything, to pursue it. So because he has an affinity for Morgan Wallen, mm-hmm. he put the album on, and he sat there in wonderment as he put the needle on the record, and he's like, "Dad, this really does sound a lot better. I can't believe the way it sounds." And it's amazing to hear that come from your kid. Right. Right, right. Yeah. It's amazing. That it's is am- really cool. And, and and to have them experience that for the first time and hear something he's listened to digitally on his ear- AirPods yeah. or, or on his, you know, phone or whatever. Totally. And now he's listening to it uh you know, through a, a, a hi fi system and sure. he's like discovering frequencies that he hasn't heard yet because it's not included into a digital everything's version. more compressed. Well, we are gonna we're getting a turntable, that's happening for one sure. and two. Yep. We I think are I got get- one, babe. But it's in Rochester. Oh my God! <laughs> See, does that count? <laughs> All right, and then we are going to get the this album when it comes out. And what was it? August, uh, the, for July, the, June thirtieth. June thirtieth for the yep, digital. Yep, Plein de Moore, It's called. Okay. Plein de Moore is French for full of love. Full of love. Very because cool. Because we really feel like that the biggest component of our society that mm-hmm. we live in today is humanity and love. Oh, I like that. And that we need more love. And we do. And it's a concept album. And it's all about cohesiveness and what we've lost in the process of the last two or three years. Yeah. What we went through, regardless of where you stand with right. the whole thing, the one thing, like the Beatles said, all you need is love. Yeah. Love is all you need, right? So it's That's just like, awesome. a, like an extension of that concept because we really feel like uh, love is really the answer to everything. And, and, and Absolutely. And Nashville is a testament to love. Mm-hmm. Love of music, love of food, love of people. Love of people. Love of everything. Love of nice weather. Love of oh, nice even love weather. snow once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I definitely want to get a vinyl copy of that. Absolutely. Um, Mike, thank you so much for coming on. You've been incredible you should really do this more often you think so yes you have a wonderful like voice and disposition for podcasting i have a face for radio a face for radio <laughs> that's what needs to happen well um thank you guys we're gonna, we're gonna thank you guys for having me yes no of course this was, it was awesome. awesome dude was i'm so excited to have you over man just because we go way back absolutely yeah, we were looking forward to this absolutely. I'm, I'm honored and and it's just a such a blessing to have uh taken taken taking this opportunity to do this with you guys hell yeah right no on. it's great well cheers to cheers. you <laughs> and All right. good luck Woo! as i shove this microphone at you <laughs> and we will talk to you soon right okay thank, thank you. you thank right. you for Bye. having me Bye. rock and roll rock and roll <laughs> rock and roll wow <laughs> <laughs> Hey guys, you've just watched another episode of Nashville on the Rocks. And if you've liked what you've seen, please hit the subscribe button. Thanks. We'll see you next time.